Cyan's a nonprofit focused on advocating for therapies of depth, insight, and relationship, therapies that create lasting change, therapies that stick. At Cyan, we have a vision of the world where these therapies are universally available to those in need. And to get there, we're committed to changing the public narrative about therapy, empowering professionals to stick up for the treatments they provide, and supporting policies that advance access. And our big tent has room for everyone, all theoretical orientations, all disciplines, researchers, administrators, users of therapy, all are welcome. We recently turned six, and we now have over 5,000 individual members and over 80 organizational members. Many of you know we've taken on a number of issues that impede practice, education, and access. And we've also published an issue of psychoanalytic inquiry on which some of the articles in this book were based. And yes, now a book. Um, we've had bookmarks for some time. Uh, now we have a book to go with them. And as the cover image shows, we aim to advance our field by bringing the focus back to the human connection, the relationship. We're honored to be joined today by some of our contributors tonight. And I just like to mention the others who aren't here, who include Nancy Burke, Farhad Dalal, Susan Lazar, Mehran Bendat, Oksana Yakushko, John Thor Cornelius, Santiago Del Bois, and of course, the two individuals whom we lost and to whom this book is dedicated, Bill Meyer and Erica Schmidt. To all of our contributors, the work of Cyan rests on your shoulders. And we're so honored you've lent your expertise to this book, to our organization, to our cause. And we're grateful and inspired for all the work you've done for our field well before Cyan was even a figment in anyone's imagination. On behalf of Janice Muir, co-founder of Cyan and editor of this book, we really hope you enjoy this discussion tonight. And let's launch this book. Please buy a copy or two or five. There is still a 20% discount coupon through tomorrow if you purchase through the publisher. And we'll, we'll put that info in the chat. And I've been really delighted to hear from many of you. And I'm just so relieved that my parents are not the only ones who have purchased a copy. Now, please write up a review, post it on Amazon, share it on social. These are some small ways you can take some action and advocate for therapies of depth, insight, and relationship. And now I'd like to introduce Tom Wildridge. Tom is an editor on this book and a longtime friend of Cyan. He's been a wonderful collaborator and colleague, and his support has meant so much. He opened his university to Cyan and hosted our first conference back in 2019, and I'm so glad he's out there educating the therapists of the next generation. Tom is chair in the Department of Psychology at Golden Gate University, as well as a psychoanalyst and board certified licensed psychologist. He's published journal articles and book chapters on topics such as eating disorders, masculinity, technology, and psychoanalytic treatment. He's published several books, including Understanding Anorexia Nervosa in Males, Psychoanalytic Treatment of Eating Disorders, When Words Fail and Bodies Speak, and an, ed an edited volume in the Relational Perspectives book series, and Eating Disorders. In addition, Dr. Wildridge has been interviewed by numerous media publications, including Newsweek, Slate, WebMD and others. He's on the Scientific Advisory Council of the National Eating Disorders Association, faculty at PINK, Psychoanalytic Institute of Northern California, and the Northern California Society for Psychoanalytic Psychology, an assistant clinical professor at UCSF Med School, and in his spare time, he has a private practice in Berkeley, California. Tom, welcome. Thank you so much, Linda. Hi, everybody. So what an exciting moment to be here. I'm going to keep my remarks uh, really brief. I'm just, um, you know, thrilled that this is out in the world now. It was such an exciting moment for me. I can remember the moment that I saw the email that um, Linda and Janice and Nancy were looking for somewhere to host their conference. And I thought, you know, um, 
students are going to be going home soon. We have a whole floor of our building that'll be empty. This would be the perfect place. And, you know, there was some self-interest involved. I have, you know, so many students who come through the graduate program at Golden Gate University. And, you know, from my perspective, there's, there's so much interest in authentic um, connection with patients. There's so much interest in therapies of depth, relationship, and insight. Um, the obstacle is, is not the interest. Um, there are many obstacles, I think, but, but it's not a lack of student interest. And so it, it seemed like such a, a fantastic opportunity to uh, provide a space um, in which, you know, so many people of such thoughtfulness and depth of experience could come together and, and bring their passion um, into the room. And, and my students could experience that and people from all over the world could experience that. And things have evolved from there, from that conference into the special issue of uh, psychoanalytic inquiry and now into a book. And so, you know, I hope, um, you know, at least from, from, I've been able to do some, some small part into getting this material out in the world, but, but, you know, for the most part, I'm really just awed by what, um, you know, the energy that, uh, that everybody involved in Cyan brings to this, uh, to this mission. It really is, um, inspiring for me. And, and, you know, whenever I speak about our program to prospective students, I, I let them know about Cyan and, and, and frame it as a real resource for people that are, you know, I think um, wanting to go into the field with heart, you know, with, with a real kind of authentic meaning in what they're pursuing. So I'll hand the mic back to, um, you know, Linda, and I'm just so excited to hear what everyone has to say today. Thanks so much, Tom. And now I'm delighted to introduce our moderator for tonight's event, Bevan Campbell. Bevan Campbell's a psychologist treating couples and individuals in Brooklyn. She has a certificate in couples therapy from Adelphi University and is an advanced candidate at the William Allenson White Institute for Psychiatry, Psychoanalysis and Psychology. She's also quite busy. She teaches graduate students at NYU and Pace. She's a clinical supervisor for psychology students at Long Island University and Pace. And around here, she's known for being the creator and the host of the Cyan Forum Live, our quarterly forum on issues impacting contemporary mental health care, just as part of her work with Cyan. She's also a consultant with the Academy of Community Behavioral Health which is a partnership between the Mayor's Office of Community Mental Health and the C CUNY School for Professional Studies, where she designs and facilitates coursework on responding to grief and loss. Thank you again all so much for being here today, and thanks so very much to our incredible, esteemed, and beloved panelists. And now take it away, Bevan. Thank you so much, Linda. Uh, it is great to be here. Thank you everyone so much for joining us tonight. Linda actually texted me a couple months ago and she said, you know, I think our next um, forum live should be a book launch. And I said, what book? What are you talking about? When on earth did you have time to write a book? And, uh, you know, it reminds me of something. We had a, a recent breakfast here in NYC where supporters of Cyan got together and someone said to me in regards to the co-founders of Cyan, these women really get things done. And of course, in getting this book done, they were aided by Tom Wooldridge, who you just heard from, and his uh, uh, serving as a co-editor on the book. So just I'm going to just briefly say a little bit about the book and then about tonight's event and the structure of it. So our panel are all contributors to the book. And in addition to being leading figures of psychoanalytic, existential, and humanistic therapies, they're all good friends and supporters of Cyan. Tonight, they're going to be discussing their contribution to Cyan's book, and together we will discuss this matter that the book takes up, which is advancing psychotherapy for the next generation. So just so you know a little bit about the book, it's organized into three sections. So in the first section, Really, this is where we talk about the social, political, and economic context that we're in right now. It sets the stage outlining the position or standing of therapies of depth, insight, and relationship, and how this came to be. Here you'll find Farhad Dalal's incisive article on our present moment's preference for quantification and measurement at the expense of humane healing. 
Also, Susan Lazar and Maram Bindet, respectively, make a strong case for the cost effectiveness of depth therapy and the legal and insurance frameworks in which we operate, or rather, are constrained. Oksana Yakushko explains how and why psychoanalysis has been excluded from academia and other professional organizations. The second section explores different aspects and qualities of therapies of depth, insight, and relationship, why they're valuable, why they are worth supporting. So along with Nancy McWilliams, Enrico Nalati, and Kirk Schneider, whom we're going to hear from tonight, uh, there is also a, a piece by John Thor Cornelius on two perspectives on mental distress, the mechanistic perspective and the holistic perspective embraced by most depth therapists. This third section moves us into implications and future actions. What do we need to know and do in order to protect psychotherapy for the next generation? Many of you are already familiar with the valuable original market research that Santiago Delbois and Linda Michaels conducted with the general public. What do they want, expect, and associate with therapy? This provides a blueprint for engaging with the public, which Cyan is going to be doing more and more of. And along with Todd Essig and Usha Tamalanara here tonight, there are gifts from two brilliant social workers who, as Linda mentioned, were devoted teachers and passionate leaders in the field that we have lost, Erica Schmidt and Bill Meyer. Erica writes about the rights of children, their right to an inner life, and Bill provides an expansive overview of his decades-long career offering loving long-term treatment to his patients. Just as a final note, I want to say advocacy can sometimes be an uncomfortable fit for individuals who have chosen a vocation which is focused on reflection, listening, paying careful attention, and developing close bonds one-on-one. -on -one. And action can be something that is even further complicated. I recognize I may just be speaking for myself here, but Cyan has shown us that advocacy and action are both necessary and possible and can be quite successful, whether it's taking on Talkspace or CareDash or BetterHelp, critiquing clinical guidelines, publishing toolkits for dealing with insurance and parity issues, or publishing a book. We hope that this panel inspires you and opens up more possibilities for you to advocate for the treatments that everyone here tonight knows have transformative power for both individuals and communities. Okay, so on to the main event. Uh, here is what we are going to be doing. So we're going to hear from each of our panelists. They're going to spe be speaking about their contribution to the book, and then we'll have a discussion, and I'll be asking some questions of the panel. At any time during the event, you can put a question into the Q&A. If you want to direct it to a particular panelist, please just indicate that in your question. And we'll save about the last 30 minutes for Q&A from the audience. So uh, with that being said, I would like to introduce our first panel panelist. Todd Essig is a training and supervising psychoanalyst at the William Allenson White Institute and a member of Cyan's advisory board. Widely known as a pioneer in the innovative uses of mental health technologies, he publishes and lectures widely. He has served on editorial boards for contemporary psychoanalysis and JAPA, and recently co-edited with Jillian Isaacs Russell a special issue of Psychoanalytic Perspectives on Psychoanalysis and Technology. In the aftermath of 9-11, he was a board chair for the NY Disaster Counseling Coalition, providing free mental health care to first responders and their families. Since March 2020, has, he has been co-chair of the American Psychoanalytic Association's COVID-19 advisory team and has been awarded Distinguished Service Awards by at the American Psychoanalytic Association and the New York State Psycholo Psychological Association for his efforts. He wrote Managing Mental Wealth for Forbes, where he, is, he has covered the intersection of technology, psychology, and culture. His practice is in New York City, where he treats individuals and couples, all of whom used to come to his office. Thank you, Todd, for being here tonight. Thanks, Bevan, for that very kind introduction and thanks to Cyan for well everything Cyan does. Special thanks to Linda, Tom, Nancy, and Janice who edited this book which together are kind of the the new point of the spear that Cyan has become. And if you doubt that imagery um, just review for a second some of the announcements for our book for our book launch. They said it's Cyan's first book so even now, while celebrating a pretty tremendous accomplishment, Cyan is already getting ready for the next. 
I'm very proud to be part of this growing organization. I also feel privileged and honored to be on a panel with colleagues whose work is so important and who have been so influential and helpful to me in my work, especially the chapter I have in this book. Right. This book. Um, it's a chapter summarizing some of the columns I wrote for Forbes that tried to bring knowledge and insight um, from psychotherapies of depth, insight and relationship to the general public. Obviously, for me to do that, I had to have something to bring. And my co-panelists have, over the years, provided many rich insights and deep knowledge. Without them and the rest of the community, I would have had a contract requiring me to write five columns a month but with very little to say. So part of the privilege of being here is that it lets me publicly say thank you to my co-panelists and to everyone else whose scholarship and clinical insights served as my raw material. But why bother doing that? Why bother writing for the general public? Well, back in the day when I was getting started, I had several of my first supervisors say some version of the treatment begins with the first phone call. Well, that was when people made and actually answered phone calls. Answering machines were still new and screening calls was marginally rude and things sure have changed. One change is that psychotherapies of depth, insight and relationship actually now begin well before the first phone call, before the first contact. And it does that in two ways, one personal and one collective. Personally, it begins with prospective patients reading our websites or noting its absence and probably doing a Google search as well, or now and going forward, maybe using Microsoft's AI enhanced Bing. Collectively, it begins with the image of psychotherapies of depth, insight and relationship being mediated by the mainstream media, social media and the entertainment industrial complex. The animating idea behind my chapter is reporting to you, my professional community, about how I participated in and tried to contribute to that collective, culturally mediated image of what we do, the image of the kind of care we provide, the image our patients bring to us in the first session. In my chapter, I hope you'll find the examples of writing to be both informative in both style and content. The style being a reminder from what any writing 101 class would put up front, the injunction to show, don't tell. Telling people that what we do is useful, even by citing all the research that documents that what we do actually is useful, is in the larger cultural conversation pretty useless, in one ear and out the other. But actually showing them something useful, well, that's the goal. And the content, well, let me violate show, don't tell, and tell you about what I wrote. I wrote about a war for the future of psychotherapy, where, where we're on one side and the algorithm warriors are on the other. Those who wanna make the very meaning of the term psychotherapy to be a set of procedures where the human qualities of the therapist are irrelevant. We're nothing more than replaceable delivery systems for procedures delivery systems that can even be replaced by a machine. I also wrote a guide for how patients can get the most from teletherapies. I urge people to realize and act according to the fact that in-person and on-screen treatments are intrinsically different experiences, even though both may be useful. I took on the absurdly high failure rates in apps for the treatment of depression by reminding people hopefully comforting those who sought and failed to get help this way, that the problem is that an app, however convenient, can't provide the human intimacy healing requires. And in the last column I wrote for Forbes, I cautioned that mid-pandemic in-person treatment behind masks and shields did not have the necessary, did not have the rewards necessary to overcome the additional risks, that wishing to go back to normal was not enough that the procedures for viral safety undermine the necessary procedures for psychological safety. In reviewing the several hundred pieces I wrote when preparing to write the chapter, I realized there was one relatively simple thread running through them all. 
technology is always value neutral with promise and peril. And those technologies that support human values and facilitate human intimacies are good tools with tremendous promise, while those that attempt to simulate and replace relationships between people with human machine interaction are worth all the fear we can muster. And with that, even though I've got a couple of minutes to spare of my allotted time, I would rather hear what my co-panelists have to say. So I'll turn the microphone over to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Todd. It was great. And your chapter was, I well, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> You'll be hearing from me later. I would like to introduce our next panelist. Enrico Naulati is a clinical psychologist based in Pasadena, California, and an affiliate professor of psychology at Seattle University. He has published numerous journal and magazine articles, and his work has been featured on Spectrum News, Algeria, Al Jazeera America, China, Glo China Global Television Network, KPCC Los Angeles, KPFK Los Angeles, KPBS San Diego, WBUR Boston, KPFA Berkeley, Wisconsin Public Radio, Public Radio Tulsa, and online at Atlantic, Salon, Psychology Today, as well as reviewed in McLean, Pacific Standard, The Huffington Post, The Australian, Prevention, and The New Yorker. As a blogger for Mag in Mad in America and Psych Alive, board member for the Psychotherapy Action Network, and through his writings and advocacy efforts, he is considered a nationally recognized reformer of mental health practice and policy. His books include Back to Normal, Why Ordinary Childhood Behavior is Mistaken for ADHD, Bipolar Disorder, and Autism Spectrum Disorder, Beacon Press 2013, Saving Talk Therapy, How Health Insurers, Big Pharma, and Slanted Science Are Ruining Good Mental Health Care, Beacon Press 2018, and Emotion Regulating Play Therapy with ADHD Children, Staying with Playing, Jason Arison, 2008. His latest books are Flourishing Love, A Secular Guide to Lasting Intimate Relationships, Phoenix Publishing House, 2023, and Peacemaking with Preschoolers, Confl I need that book, Conflict Resolution to Promote Emotional Mastery and Harmonious Classrooms, Good Media Press, 2023. Thank you so much for being here, Enrico. Enrico, you're still muted. Whoops, how about now? You're great. Oh, sorry about that. A big thank you to you, Bevan, and the others for the labor that you put into um, putting this event together. Um, I, like Todd, I'm honored to be part of such a distinguished panel and to be part of an organization like Cyan, which I happen to think is extraordinarily important in the current mental health landscape for advocacy reasons. And uh, I'm honored every which way to, and will and will do my part in the organization for years to come. So, I mean, I wrote a chapter that's titled Relational Healing and Psychotherapy, Reaching Beyond the Research. Uh, you, you, I urge you to read that chapter and get an academic perspective on what I'm about to say. But I thought I would take the, the brief time that I have to maybe say something a little bit more punchy that is at, at the essence of what's contained in that article. Um, so when I ponder the current state of our chosen profession, I'm reminded of a cheeky but poignant remark made by the maverick existential psychiatrist R.D. Lang when I saw him speak at the University of Washington in the late 1980s. And I'll say it with a Scottish brogue because some of you may or may not know I'm actually from Scotland, was born and raised in Scotland. And he said something like this. He said, it's a sheer travesty in our field that to sit and be present with a suffering other in helpful ways, you have to begin by de-educating yourself of all your schooling. And what I believe he had in mind here is perhaps even truer now than ever is the alienating and depersonalizing effects of objectifying clients as symptom carriers or pathological entities um, and, and seeing the pathway to understanding and helping them as derivative of empirically supported techniques, dismissive 
of the sort of personal subjective knowledge of human suffering the therapist might have access to in order to truly be of help. So the greatest counter transferential pitfalls I see um, newly minted therapists having pertain to kind of overripe needs to be productive and clever in the room with clients. I think graduate schools and training programs perpetuate a false and smug sense of confidence in trainees, whereby they enter the world of clinical practice, ready to fit the client to the therapy, rather than fit the therapy to the client. And I think fitting the client to the therapy, you can always fall back on your theories and techniques with a sense of conviction that they should work if you just stick to them. And if the client bombs out of therapy, then he, she, they were not ready to change, were resistant, were too defended, needed too much control in the process, and any number of other kind of rationalizations. So in the frenzy to establish and distinguish ourselves as psychotherapists, whether it be acquiring a specialty and working with a newly minted psychological condition or becoming some more fastidious practitioner of our chosen therapeutic paradigm, we overlook, I think, the ordinary ordinariness of what constitutes good psychotherapy. Um, often it is out of a sense of real responsibility to the client or to the interaction with the client that our own need to be clever is overridden and we return to time-honored human virtues such as forbearance, sensitivity, tact, even-mindedness, honesty, and courage uh, in our approach. Um, so, you know, the ordinariness of good psychotherapy, I think, involves taking clients at their word, truly entering and residing in the manifest content of their narratives, a more experienced near approach, the warp and woof of their everyday lives, what they, they feel actually matters, often requires that we give ourselves over to the ordinary. Um, much of what is salutary uh, uh, in terms of relational unlearning and relearning that occurs in therapy remains implicit, embedded in the moment-to-moment -moment client therapy therapist interactions in the form of mutually coordinated eye contact, speech prosody, voice cadence, and other rudimentary forms of human interaction. A smile, a sincere frown, or merely count countenancing, countenancing ah, can't, can't say that with an American non-Scottish accent. Maybe I should just say it with a Scottish accent. Countenancing. See? When you go back to your roots, it works. Um, uh, a smile, a sincere frown, or merely countenancing the calm demeanor of the therapist at the right moment when the client expected disapproval can have liberating effects no matter how imperceptive. I'm going to run out of time if I don't jump ahead here. At the end of the day, I think it's the personhood of the therapist and the prudent uses that person, uh, the prudent uses of that personhood in clinical ways. I think supports or is constitu constitutive of uh, uh, good psychotherapy. I think to be a credible therapist, you first have to be a credible person. Um, there's a lot that we learn from our schooling, but I think more importantly, there's what can be learned in the school of life. And I think that's uh, I'll, uh, the direction that those of us who are dedicated to be devoted therapists have to turn uh, a life. And here I'm talking about a life of depth and dimensionality, which I think improves that relational goodness of fit that a therapist might have with an array of clients across a variety of problems in living. Um, uh, from I think that to empathize with clients, you don't necessarily have to have shared their distinct loss, trauma, dilemma. But I do think what you have to share is is the under the emotional underbelly of all of that, what it's like to betray and feel betrayed, uh, deep mourning, uh, um, uh, uh, 
to act pridefully, to act mercifully, to uh, uh, um, refuse to act mercifully, whatever the existential or perennial human forms of misery or joy or angst or, uh, uh, that underlie all of that, I think you have to have a human familiarity with that. And yes, we obtain that from our own personal therapy. Uh, uh, if we're lucky, like myself, I came through the master's program in existential humanistic psychology at Seattle University, one of the rare uh, types of programs that exist. If you're fortunate, you come through a program like that, that puts you in touch with and helps you expand your humanity. If you're not, then I think that you have to turn towards the school of life in order, I think, to uh, 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 live subversively in ways that um and take risks in ways that, that that allow you to tap in to broad dimensions of of the human condition i think we need to emphasize that more and more in our profession I've, i'm gonna i've I'm, I'm sure i'm out of time but i'll just say a few few more things uh i uh uh, uh and so for for people listening on, people that will read the book, people that will get academic perspectives and all that we have to say at a more personal level, please do not discount the, the living of a life, the pursuit of a flourishing life, uh, uh, and, and what can be derived from that at the level of our own personhood, and how that then gets converted as a, so a deep source of personal knowledge that gets converted into something called clinical knowledge that has great utility. And let's bring this full cycle back to um, uh, uh, R.D. Lang, that, le that is the real stuff of life that I think that positions us to sit with a suffering other and be of help to a suffering other. And, and I'll end there. Thank you so much, Enrico. I think this mm -hmm. chapter is really required reading for anyone who teaches, trains, or supervises psychotherapists. Um, okay. Oh, and also I, I love moderating a panel of, of therapists because everyone keeps their eye on the clock. So it's very, um, <laughs> and make sure they stay in the frame. Um, I'd like to introduce our next panelist. We're very excited to have Nancy McWilliams, PhD, joining us tonight. She's a visiting professor emerita at Rutgers University's Graduate School of Applied and Professional Psychology. Emerita, I'm sorry, I said that very strangely, yeah. and has a private practice in Lambertville, New Jersey. She is author and psych of Psychoanalytic Diagnosis in 1984 and revised in 2011, Psychoanalytic Case Formulation in 1999, Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy 2004, and Psychoanalytic Supervision in 2021, all with Guilford Press. She has edited or contributed to several other books and is associate editor of the Psychodynamic Diagnostic Manual in 2006 and is on the editorial board of the Journal of Psychoanalytic Psychology. A former president of the Division 39 Psychoanalysis of the American Psychological Association, she has been featured in three APA videos of master clinicians. She is on the Board of Trustees of the Austin Riggs Center in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and her books are available in 20 languages. She has taught in 30 countries. Thank you for joining us here tonight, Nancy. Thank you for having me. I am a great fan and supporter of Cyan. When you guys started to form an organization, I was so thrilled that something was starting to happen that involved advocacy for my beloved field. Um, my chapter is uh, called Diagnosis and its Discontents, because uh, I've been very interested in how the language in which we talk about things determines how we think about things. And starting in 1980, with changes to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, we saw changes that uh, over time have uh, formed a, a way of thinking about people that has been very problematic. Um, I have a lifelong interest in individual differences. Um, and as I learned more about psychotherapy, as I grew into adulthood, 
I got very interested in what individual differences mean for psychotherapy. So I've always been interested in diagnosis, but diagnosis as the Greek term um, actually implies, the Greek term is, means a kind of thorough or th through uh, knowledge. Gnosis is knowledge and via is through. And it's, it's about trying to understand something in depth. Um, when I was first learning psychotherapy, I got interested in um, implications for therapy of different personality styles that had been identified, such as more schizoid, more narcissistic, more obsessive compulsive, more paranoid, and so on. And I don't mean that people had a disorder, but everybody has a personality and has particular kinds of ways of dealing with the world. I was interested not only in those categories, but also in differences of gender, sexual orientation, um, race, culture, spirituality, ability, uh, whether you were an adoptee or a twin or an only child or one of nine children or a person with a physical challenge or a member of a cult, it just, it mattered to figure out what impact your own background had um, on you in order to find the empathy to help the patient therapeutically. And very early, I was deeply helped myself by my personal psychoanalytic treatment in ways I had not even been able to conceptualize before I went into treatment. So um, I was always interested in the deeper story. Um, I had an experience that I know some of you have heard me talk about before that made me aware of what was starting to happen to the field. It was in the early 90s, I was speaking at a hospital that had me interview its most difficult, perplexing patients in, some of, in front of some of their trainees. And uh, in both cases, the patient ended up telling me things that they hadn't talked to the staff about. And when I was leaving, I heard one of the listeners say to another person in training, that's a great line she uses. I'm going to try using that line with my patients. And so I turned around and told the guy I'd been eavesdropping and asked him what line of mine it was that he had latched onto. And he said, can you say more about that? Oh, <laughs> he had not been trained to evoke from a patient the elaboration of what the patient was experiencing. He had been trained to take the DSM and and basically say, do you endorse this? Do you endorse this? Do you endorse this? Is it more than two weeks or less than two weeks? Check the box. And I realized we were going in a very bad direction. Um, in 1980, the DSM was, and I'm not saying that the DSM before that was great. It had many difficulties, but in 1980, the DSM was revised to meet the needs of a certain kind of researcher in clinical outcome and to meet the needs of demographers. It was not revised to meet the needs of psychotherapists. In fact, the editors of every edition of the DSM since 1980 have had at least one paragraph in there saying, this manual is not intended to substitute for case formulation and seasoned clinical judgment or words to that effect. Nonetheless, these kind of reified categories that they started coming up with so that it would be easier to do research um, have had a big impact on us. Uh, researchers didn't want to have to get five years of clinical training to learn how to diagnose narcissistic personality disorder. If they went to therapists and said, how do you diagnose narcissistic personality disorder? Most of us would say something like, well, you take the patient into treatment and if you see if most of their preoccupations are narcissistic, if they have a self-object transference, and we would talk like that, and that's no help to researchers. They just wanted to have either or categories going on. That shift made a certain kind of sense from a certain kind of perspective, but we lost the dimensional 
perspective, the idea that things are better or worse, that most things are on a continuum. We lost the contextual perspective that it makes a huge difference if you look paranoid. If you're in a situation that's making everybody paranoid who's in it, like if you're an undocumented um, worker who's trying to get more money out of the boss and the boss is threatening to uh, report you to immigration authorities if you aren't happy working for below the minimum wage, that can make you kind of paranoid. That's very different from a person with a paranoid psychosis or a paranoid personality disorder. So context matters and inference matters. You know, what is the meaning of something? We have this peculiar count, uh, situation now in the DSM where um, it, we, it's as if we had we had other another medical document, and we were categorizing people based on fever disorders versus limp disorders versus skin rash disorders, and putting things together based on their symptomatic presentations, which aren't a thing. Um, we have these reified categories in the DSM, and we all start to think in them, and they were very um, appealing to drug companies because they could say, ah, it's our drug that heals these disorders. Dr. Nyalati's book on what's happened to psychotherapy is brilliant at talking about these forces. Insurance companies wanted to believe that um, these simple diagnostic categories and reducing their symptoms was the definition of psychotherapy because that meant they didn't have to um, support uh, any kind of really open-ended effort to understand somebody. Also, um, starting in the middle of the 90s, we all began to be managed by insurance companies, uh, whether or not we were on their panels. Um, and they were spending immense amounts of money paying bureaucrats to basically find ways to deny treatment. I got this email in uh, 2014 from a cognitive behavioral colleague of mine who sent it out to the New Jersey listserv. He says, I'm currently treating a patient who has suffered with major depression, was socially isolated, never had a girlfriend, and was stuck in a dead-end job. In the past six months, he has made enormous progress. He has gotten off addictive drugs, developed several good friendships, received a big promotion at work, and has become engaged to a very nice woman. In addition, he has stopped missing and coming late to sessions. Not bad to accomplish all that in a six-month period. The only thing is that this six-month period occurred in his seventh year of treatment. Okay. This is from a CBT colleague who then says, short-term CBT, question mark. Seasoned therapists know how long it takes to change things that are really significant. And we're all feeling this from all orientations. One of the reasons I really uh, appreciate Cyan is that it's such an open tent. Um, my chapter in the book is, a, is also about the psychodynamic diagnostic manual, which is one way we tried to make up for the limitations of the DSM and keep alive the clinical tradition and the diagnostic sensibility that involves dimensionality, context, uh, inference and um, meaning. And I see I'm already getting low on time. So let me just mention some research by uh, also a not, not a psychoanalytic group, but Miller and Moyers on therapist qualities that correlate with patient improvement and satisfaction. This is as empirical as you get. They went through hundreds of studies to discern what correlated with good outcome, and it's not the brand name of the therapy. Here are the qualities, accurate empathy, acceptance, positive regard, genuineness, focus, hope and expectation, emotional evocation, and the offering of information. That's the empirical basis, no matter what they say about, you know, short-term evidence-based treatments for symptom reduction, which is not, not the worst kind of uh, research design if you want to study short-term symptom reduction, but it really says very little about 
actual real world psychotherapy. If you want to think about actual real world psychotherapy, you have to think about those kinds of qualities and how to foster them in people. I think I will stop there and listen to my colleagues say some more inspiring things. Thank you, Nancy. I just realized my psychodynamic diagnostic manual is the only book that's always on my desk. <laughs> so right next to me. Uh, thank you so much for those uh, thoughts. And, and now I'm going to introduce our next panelist. Usha Tamalanara is a clinical psychologist and the director of community-based education at the Albert and Jesse Danielson Institute of, of Institute of Research, professor in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at Boston University. Her research and scholarship focuses on immigration, trauma, race, and culturally informed psychoanalytic psychotherapy. She is also an independent practice and works primarily with survivors of trauma from diverse socio-cultural backgrounds. Dr. Tumalanara is an associate editor of Psychoanalytic Dialogues and the Asian American Journal of Psychology. She serves on the Holmes Commission on Racial Equality of the American Psychoanalytic Association. She's the author of Psychoanalytic Theory and Cultural Competence in Psychotherapy, 2016, and the editor of Trauma and Racial Minority Immigrants. Turmoil, Uncertainty, and Resistance, 2021, both published by the American Psychological Association Books. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Bevan, for your kind introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to join everybody here. Thanks so much to uh, Linda and Janice and Tom and Cyan for uh, the opportunity to join this wonderful panel. Um, and to be a part of this book, it's, uh, I'm just really honored. Um, I just, you know, in thinking about how to talk about this chapter, this particular chapter that I wrote um, in the book, it focuses on psychoanalytic applications in a diverse society. And this is a topic that I've, uh, that's been sort of at the, at the core of my work for a, quite a while now. And um, in particular, I explore issues of race and culture in clinical and community applications of psychoanalytic theory. For me, the relevance and importance of psychoanalytic ideas uh, really need to be made accessible to the public, particularly to marginalized communities. And that's the perspective I take in this, in this chapter. Um, so I wanna read to you just the opening paragraph of this chapter and then describe to you um, the relevance of this opening, this opener, um, to a, a, a recent project that's community oriented. Um, and, and I hope that that will give you a sense of my thinking in this area. So this is the opener. In his paper, Wild Psychoanalysis, Freud cautioned against the loose interpretation of psychoanalytic theory and technique as he offered a glimpse into a broader usage of psychoanalytic ideas by those not formally trained as psychoanalysts. Inherent in his critique was a cautionary statement about the analyst's interpretation of psychoanalytic ideas and an, em and an emphasis on self-discovery by the client without the analyst's imposition. This notion of loose interpretation of psychoanalytic ideas is complicated, on one hand, psychoanalysis itself has been interpreted differently in some important ways within different schools of thoughts, like ego psychology, the British School of Object Relations, and relational psychoanalysis. If psychoanalysis were not subject to interpretation and modification, then these schools of thoughts would not have as much to offer as they do today. On the other hand, broader interpretations of psychoanalytic principles may still be experienced as precarious, particularly in the way that psychoanalytic ideas may be applied to understandings of diversity within clinical and non-clinical contexts, such as in community-based interventions. So um, this is an opener to a chapter that uh, considers the enormity of sociocultural traumas um, and diversities that, in, that really affect our daily lives. And psychoanalysis, in my view, certainly has much to offer with regard to understanding and addressing traumas in the clinic and beyond. And my work has always centered on the idea that all of us 
should be afforded the choice of psychotherapy and that we all have access to the type of psychotherapy that would be most helpful to us. I, as an Indian American person, I grew up in a community that had very little understanding of the relevance and value of psychotherapy. And oftentimes people thought if you, if something was bothering you, there was an emotional concern that you would talk maybe with a, a, a friend, a close friend, maybe a family member, but you really don't take it outside of the family. You really don't talk about it openly. And you certainly don't seek help from a therapist because that might deem you crazy. You know, that this was this is a common notion that's still pervasive today among many communities. And, um, and the idea of seeking help from a therapist who may not understand your cultural background, may not understand your circumstances, may potentially pathologize how you and your family do things and how you experience culture um, and, um, and how you sort of structure your family life. All of these things are worries and concerns, certainly that I grew up with and around. Um, but of course, the difficult thing here is that we don't get a chance to then address the issues, the problems that we are facing within our communities and our families. And to Nancy's point around diagnosis and its discontents, I love the name of that chapter, Nancy, because it, you know, it sort of it, it brought me right to the discontents within a different context of how diagnosis was conceptualized in the community that I grew up in. Um, and uh, you know, so in thinking about this idea of improving access to in-depth psychotherapies for people facing multiple forms of marginalization within communities, outside of their communities, um, uh, Cyan's mission in particular resonates deeply with me and, and my experience and what I've been trying to do in my own work, both within a clinical setting, but also outside in a community setting. So let me just share a brief example with you recently um, that uh, and a, this is a project I've been working on um, over the last year um, where I've been trying to have more conversations around mental health in an Indian American cultural and religious center. And this is a community that I've been a part of. My children have gone to uh, you know, Sunday classes at this center while they were growing up. And so there's a personal connection there too. And recently the center has opened up to the idea that they wanna learn about psychotherapy and particularly in-depth psychotherapies. They wanna learn about mental health. And when I was invited to come in, the organizer pulled me aside privately and said, please don't talk too much about trauma because that would just be that would just be too much for people here to hear about uh, something so negative. And so I said, well, let's just try to develop some trust <laughs> with each other that I can talk about trauma in a way that people can hear it and in a way that might resonate with them. And so one of the, uh, one of the ways in which I tried to tackle this was to speak in the language of my community um, and this particular community. And there was a, this is, this is going to tie back to what Enrico, you mentioned about the pursuit of a flourishing life. And in Hinduism, in this particular philosophy of Hinduism that we follow, there's this belief that happiness is a birthright. That is something that we have a right to as human beings. And so this is the kind of framework that I used in thinking about mental health and traumas. So if we try to contextualize what we mean by mental health, and the pursuit of a flourishing life or the pursuit of happiness, that in-depth psychotherapies can offer something beyond survival and something in addition to symptom management. Um, and so there was this incredible uh, response to this. And since then have been invited to talk with the young people, the teenagers, the adolescents and the young adults in this community. So. I just see incredible possibilities for uh, those of us engaged and interested in in-depth psychotherapies um, and trying to make them accessible, trying to bring our ideas and our theories and understandings to communities who typically don't have access to this information, who've actually been told 
over and over again that this is not relevant to them in so many different ways. Um, so I just want to leave us with the the um, the possibility of expanding what we do into clinical as well as non-clinical domains. Um, so I'll leave us with that and move forward. Thank you so much, Usha. I'm going to introduce our next panelist. Kirk Schneider, PhD, is a licensed psychologist and a leading spokesperson for contemporary existential humanistic psychology. Dr. Schneider is the current president of the Existential Humanistic Institute, council member of the American Psychological Association, past president of the Society for Humanistic Psychology, Division 32 of the APA, recent past editor of the Journal of Humanistic Psychology, an adjunct faculty member at Saybrook University and Teachers College, Columbia University. Dr. Schneider is also an honorary member of the Society for Existential Analysis and the East European Association for Existential Therapy. A fellow of the APA, Dr. Schneider has published over 200 articles, interviews, and chapters, and has authored or edited 14 books, including The Spirituality of Awe, The Polarized Mind, Awakening to Awe, the Handbook of Humanistic Psychology, Existential Humanistic Therapy, Existential Integrative Psychotherapy, the Wiley World Handbook of Existential Therapy, and the just published, published Life Enhancing Anxiety, Key to a Sane World. Dr. Schneider's work has been featured in Scientific America, the New York Times, Psychology Today, and many other health and psychology outlets. Thank you so much for being here, Kirk. Well, thank you so much, Bevan. And everyone here. I'm deeply appreciative to be part of this group, this august group, and deeply appreciative to Cyan for pulling a number of the threads, a number of the voices in depth psychology together, because we are certainly more powerful together in our perspective than we are in our separate silos, so to speak. So thank you again. And this is a terrific outgrowth, this book of that project. So I'm going to speak uh, a bit more from what I'd call an existential perspective on uh, these issues. Uh, it reflects my chapter toward a science of the heart, revival of romanticism and psychology. So let's begin at the beginning, the root, as I see it, of the rampant reductionism in our field and our country. And that is the primal terror of the human condition. Urangst, U-R-A-N-G-S-T, as Otto Rank, the early psychoanalyst put it, or the helplessness and groundlessness associated with lived experience, and ultimately associated with our thrownness into existence at birth. I see this as a, really a template in many ways for subsequent anxiety and trauma, and also many of the defensive maneuvers that have been erected in our culture, in our field. So, so much it seems, so much seems to funnel back to that crucible that I just referred to in our quick fix instant result world. Many of us seem to do everything we can to avoid the helplessness and groundlessness of our human condition from the start. Thus, we construct simpler and easier routes to address our anxieties. But in the process, we overlook the deeper, more intensive routes that can sustain and reward us in the longer run. Is this avoidance perhaps the subtler basis for the adherence to logical positivism, the natural science paradigm, the machine model for living, so pervasive in our field of psychology and psychotherapy? Is this avoidance perhaps the subtler basis, along with the profit margin, by which the shorter term programmatic therapies are so often seen as the be all and end all? in our society. 
And I don't want a broad brush at all. I certainly see a value to those approaches. I consider myself existential integrator, but too often seen as the be all and end all, the endpoints uh, for successful therapy. How about turning to the wisdom of the putative founder of our field, William James? How much do we really hark back to this founding genius? whose advice way back in 1892 was almost totally ignored in the decades since when he wrote the following, and I'm gonna quote from the, the top of my chapter. James says, when we talk of psychology as a natural science, we must not assume that that, that means a sort of psychology that stands at last on solid ground. It means just the reverse. It means a psychology particularly fragile and into which the waters of metaphysical criticism leak at every joint. A psychology whose elementary assumptions and data must be reconsidered in wider connections and translated into other terms. I think that's a lot of what we are pursuing here and hearkening to. Enter Romanticism, or the neo-romantic psychology, which derived from 18th and 19th century thinkers such as Goethe and the American transcendentalists, who didn't so much reject rationalism with a capital R, uh, or the rationalism of natural science, but felt it needed to be enlarged and deepened in order to more accurately reflect the human experience or as the phenomenologist Edmund Husserl put it, the lived world. My chapter toward a science of the heart is really about a call to revive, to revive this earlier effort, this direction of depth as Freud as well pursued and centers around three basic themes, the interrelated wholeness of experience, Second, access to such wholeness by means of tacit experiences, such as affect, intuition, imagination, and kinesthesia or embodiment. And third, qualitative descriptive accounts of such processes, such as phenomenology. This approach means further that we need to enlarge upon the idea that understanding in psychology can be equated with measurement and overt behaviors. By contrast, understanding must encompass, must also encompass rich description, the arts and humanities notwithstanding, as even Freud noted in his classic uh, article on lay analysis. So even such an early skeptic of qualitative research as D.T. Campbell wrote that, quote, more and more, I have come to the conclusion that the core of the scientific method is not experimentation per se, but the strategy connoted by the phrase plausible rival hypotheses. Yes, plausibility is so key here. In other words, something more akin to William James's idea of radical empiricism, where lived experiences are counted as data along with the overt and measurable. And the question is, the question is really, how plausible is that data given other, given other rivaling and plausible findings? Particularly if the, ex if the experience is profound, like the impact of the therapeutic bond on the quality of a patient's life, and not just measurable aspects of their life, but their life as a whole in their deepest recesses. So particularly if the experience is profound like that, the parsing of human experience into quantitative units should not be the arbiter of that experience, but the plausibility of that experience against the background of rivaling quantitative and qualitative hypotheses should give us a better grasp of that experience. Finally, it is no secret to many of you here that key aspects of lived experience, that is affect, intuition, imagination, and kinesthesia, are in fact integral, if not directly correlated 
with the key elements of therapeutic effectiveness research, at least the leading research that many of us are aware of. I refer to the contextual relational factors highlighted by folks like Bruce Wampole and John Norcross regarding the therapeutic alliance, empathy, genuineness, mutuality, and affect, to name a few. And Rico elaborated on this uh, just before, and a number of us have. So isn't it high time that our field recognize what even mainstream researchers have been underscoring for years, that therapies and therapeutic elements of depth, insight, and relationship are key to, to the fuller understanding as well as revitalization of suffering human beings. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Kirk. Um, Kirk's chapter first appeared in the American Psychologist, and I actually teach it in a history of psychology course. I highly recommend checking it out. Okay. Um, finally, uh, we have Alan Sholem, PhD. He's a past president of the section of psychoanalysis. I'm sorry, before I continue this, I just want to remind everyone, if you have any questions for the panel, please do put them in the Q&A. Thank you so much. Um, let me begin again. He is a past president of the section of psychoanalyst of the Division of Psychoanalysis of the APA on the core faculty and board of the Chicago Center for Psychoanalysis on the faculty of the Institute for Clinical Social Work and a member of the steering committee of the Psychotherapy Action Network. He served as president of the Chicago Association for Psychoanalytic Psychology, first vice chairperson of the Chicago Community Mental Health Board, founder and chairperson of the Illinois Coalition of Mental Health Professionals and Consumers, and mental health policy advisor to Illinois U.S. Senator, Senator Al Adlai Stevenson, Jr. Dr. Shlom is published and has published and presented widely on the interface between psychoanalysis and politics, primarily regarding mental health care issues. He has taught classes and led workshops on psychoanalysis and politics. He's in private practice. He is in the private practice of psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you for the uh, wonderful introduction. It's, uh, it's good to hear. You actually wonder, oh, did I do all that? Um, but thank you so much. And it's a, it's a joy to be here. Um, from the early days um, when we had the first conference before, a few years ago, um, we were thinking we, we can't let this um, stop here, that there has to be something that comes out of a, a, a conference. And Cyan is what came out. And um, um, it's, I want to um, present uh, in my talk today, uh, a history of why we are here, um, that um, uh, it isn't an accident that we're here. There's a, there are, are some historical forces that uh, have led us to be here. Um, and the most prominent theme that all of the wonderful speakers um, today have spoken of resides in the humanity. It's in the title of the book, Humanizing the Field. I think this is the purpose of our work is to maintain a humanity. I think actually that psychoanalysis came into existence as a, um, a force to preserve humanity, as a force to preserve subjectivity against the backdrop of the Industrial Revolution, which served to fragment and alienate. And so psychoanalysis didn't just come from Freud's head, although a lot did, but but Freud, you know, in certain became a spokesperson or the, the, the in the vanguard of the need to preserve subjectivity and humanity. There was Jane Addams, uh, there were unions, there was a rise uh, in the uh, early uh, 20th century that um, 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 pushed psychoanalysis forward in a certain way or impelled it because of what was happening in the world. And the same thing is true of what's happening now in the world. I think Cyan comes about because. It needs to be here. Um, and I'm gonna present some of the historical forces um, that uh, I think led to that. But I wanna start with just um, to sh sh show the importance of this, that um, there was a recent um, piece about um, um, entitled Shorter Lives, Poorer Health. 
It's a, a, you may have heard the NPR piece, a summary of it. There was a book that was published 10 years ago about the status of healthcare in the United States. And, um, uh, and this is an update of that book. And in the book there was, and uh, the research, it was a tremendous indictment about um, the healthcare system in the United States and the general poorer health that exists here. Um, that we are, for instance, our, our life expectancy keeps going down. And by contrast to other countries, um, even with the pandemic, which went, which caused life's expectancy to go down, all the other countries in Europe and uh, the, I should say the first world countries and even some of the third world countries, life expectancy has continued to go up. But in the United States, it's continued to go down, which is sort of an indictment of the system that we have here. You may um, be aware of Bernie Sanders' new book, It's Okay to Be Angry at Capitalism, where I think he's trying to say that the, the time is right to speak out against the deterioration of the system, which I think has been happening over the last 40 years under the rise of neoliberalism, which is the background political uh, operations that are going on uh, today. And for those of you who aren't altogether familiar with what neoliberalism means, but it's, it's, it's a form of capitalism late stage that has to do um, with the uh, free market fundamentalism that you nothing should get, get in the way of profit, profit above all. And I think it's important to understand this because what has happened in mental health, which has been a deterioration of services. I mean, we, you know, over, uh, there was a period in, in um, from ni 1996 to 2009, where mental health funding, for instance, in the United States um, uh, went down relative to physical health funding by about 70%. In other words, we've, it's in, in, in aggregate money terms, there's less being spent on mental health than there was you know, back in the 90s. So there's been this, this kind of deterioration. Now, the, in healthcare, the, in the aggregate sense that the um, uh, piece, uh, Shorter Lives, uh, Poor Health, was speaking to, um, of course, also implicated um, uh, mental health care, but talked about a range of social problems that um, um, uh, eventuated in people be, being uh, falling ill and dying at a, at a faster rate than in other countries. And that were, was the case uh, even 20 years ago that things have deteriorated even more, that um, uh, the access to services, in fact, uh, my friend Enrico has, has, a, has a good piece about, wonderful piece about um, um, the numbers of therapy sessions over these, the last period of time, that we have less sessions per uh, course of treatment on ag aggregate, and we're get being reimbursed at a, at a lower level than we have been on aggregate. And this, is, this, this trend is continuing along um, and getting worse and worse. Um, so where uh, the, the backdrop that we're talking about is, is not a, a friendly backdrop to us. And I think it's, it's incumbent upon us to understand the politics of it so that we can act in a, in a more uh, uh, effective fashion, understand what exactly is going on. And of course, this, is, this has to do with the history of uh, the last 40 years of neoliberalism and um, what has happened within the uh, professions as a result of that. So let me, let me begin with my own journey, um, which started uh, in the early 80s um, when um, uh, I was just beginning my practice. I was leaving academia and going into uh, full-time practice. And I got a utilization review from um, someone, you know, on one of my patients who was a very, and the patient was a very troubled uh, um, young woman. And um, I could have, uh, and needed uh, intensive treatment. And I get this utilization review saying, oh, well, she really doesn't need very much. And, um, uh, you know, you can do something or other in 20 sessions and that should take care of it. And this is a very troubled person. And at that point, um, I thought to myself, they're trying to kill us. Um, and um, uh, and in, in fact, that's really what th is behind the scenes. They're, try they're trying to kill us you know, by virtue of making more profit for themselves. Um, this is the insurance, of course, the health insurance industry, which at the time had a contract with the American Psychological Association um, to um, do the utilization reviews. Um, and there was a movement within APA uh, amongst a number of psychologists to um, stop this contract, to, to kind of get APA to stop being in active collusion with the insurance industry. 
And that was a great success. Actually, we stopped them, you know, and they, they pulled out and um, um, cut up the contract uh, with uh, the various insurance companies that they had contracts with. Okay, now this great victory, which we thought was a great victory, actually resulted in the insurance companies deciding, well, we'll do this one by ourselves. Instead of paying a psychologist to, to do this on each other, we'll just do this ourselves. And that started the rise of managed care. That's what happened in, in the late 80s uh, um, in terms of the um, um, consolidation of power and uh, for profit, of course, by the health insurance industry. Um, in, in, in a prior paper, I written about the, the, the corporate takeover of healthcare. Um, and I think that was what was, in fact was happening because healthcare was and is the biggest industry in the country. It's, it's like 17 to 18% of GDP, which is a huge amount of money. And so before uh, the, the 1980s, let's just say, you know, healthcare in America was basically a, a few mom and pop uh, hospitals and some religious institutions uh, loosely organized, but it was very fragmented. And then there wasn't, uh, uh, and it was a uh, ripe for the picking, you might say, in terms of um, uh, uh, corporations coming to dominate. And that's what happened, in fact, and that contributed to the rise of managed care. They came up with an ideology, you know, that uh, we were going to lower costs through uh, competition and, and it's going to be better treatment and all this other nonsense. You know, so they came, they came up with a whole um, way of talking about this whole new language, language of utilization review and cost containment and all these wonderful things. Um, that was supposed to make healthcare that much more accessible to everybody, except it really was just a ruse to make money, which is what has been happening. So, okay, so we go through that rise of uh, managed care. And through that time, we, there was an organization that was started called the National Coalition of Mental Health Professionals and Consumers, which was something that uh, uh, a number of us you know, came together and much like the cyan, except the time was, it was earlier in a certain sense, you know, we were very successful at um, um, uh, consciousness raising, I suppose, we, we, to alert people to what was happening. That was our, our, you know, the overarching mission that we had, but uh, the time wasn't right. There wasn't the critical mass. And I think that's what, that's what cyan in a certain sense represents that, that we, we're here because we need to be here because this, things have deteriorated to the point where uh, our work has been obviously undermined, it's been challenged, it's been uh, via, um, 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 the various powers that be. And one of the ways in which it's been undermined and challenged is through the, the notions of evidence-based practice, which derive out of the empirically validated treatments movement that uh, was started within the American Psychological Association um, to you know, uh, uh, consolidate power within um, uh, the hands of, uh, let's just say, the academic uh, psychologists who were doing the research on on, on, uh, on short-term treatments, because that fit the model that the insurance companies wanted. They needed to have a short, have an intellectual sort of a justification for keeping treatment very short. Um, and it's not that the treatments uh, are, are problematic. There's nothing you know, inherently wrong with uh, uh, the very short, shorter-term treatments, CBT and otherwise, um, as short-term treatments in psychoanalysis too. Um, but this, but but the point really is that this was meant as a um, convenient uh, connection that the insurance companies could use to deny uh, treatment. That they had an intellectual rationalization for it, and therein lies the um, uh, movement toward empirically validated treatments, which then led to uh, evidence-based practice. Empirically validated treatments with one ed, one stool, one one leg of the three-legged. Uh, evidence-based practice uh, uh, stool, which includes uh, research, patient experience, and therapist expertise, and all three have to be included. Okay, so um, so we go from there to um, um, and th and this was something obviously that the that the, within the American Psychological Association there was a great deal of struggle over. Okay? There was a big battle, and I, I, my own view was that um, the um, um, uh, there was a great threat within APA as to uh, many practitioners coming into the organization and power shifting in that sense toward the practitioners. And so the academic psychologists, you know, sort of rallied around their own research models and so forth. Again, there's nothing particularly wrong with any of that. It's just the way it, it was used by the insurance industry to as a cover for their efforts. Um, 
So we go from, from that, you know, and there were big fights within APA at that time. Um, they actually tried to make it unethical for anybody to practice uh, anything other than an empirically validated treatment. And this was, you know, a threat to our actual livelihood where they were saying, we're trying to make it unethical. Now, fortunately that effort was beaten back, but it just shows you the, what, what the context was at the time that this was you know, very, very sort of- Alan, I'm so uh, sorry to interrupt, Alan. I just wanted to say, I know we have a few questions in the Q and A, so I wanted to make sure, but let me, I, let me give you another minute or two and then maybe we can move on to the questions. Absolutely, I'll bring it, I'll bring it to a close by, by talk, you know, by, because it goes on and on. It's in my chapter and you can read it there, but I just wanted to give you a, a flavor for the thing. And for the idea of fantasy, because the chapter is infused with fantasy, and that's the, the, the main thing that uh, I wanted to talk a lot about. And so far as evidence-based practice is sort of like the idea that, you know, it's, it's science, this is real science, and it's, it's objective, and it's this and it's that. But a lot of it is not so objective and not so good. And there's a fantasy element to it that somehow science is going to save us, or so this is going to um, um, result in our getting better. Um, and there's all, all manner of fantasies that are involved in, 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 in the whole pursuit of, um, of what is in, 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 in the consequence of what has happened to us in, these days. And, and so uh, it, it's in the de deconstruction of some of these fantasies, like the fantasy of, of, uh, of uh, the free market, the fantasy of, of, fee, uh, of, uh, of big government, of uh, the American dream even uh, has fantasy elements. And I think this is part of what we can do ourselves to deconstruct. Uh, the work in terms of making it into something it's, what psychoanalysis is meant to do is to deconstruct fantasy. And I think that's a big part of, of what uh, we can bring to bear in terms of uh, the situation that we're uh, struggling with. Okay, I'll stop there. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. I have a few um, questions and, and really the most important one I think is from the chat that I'd like to direct to the panel um, because I think it really speaks to the theme comes from Jonathan Kane, and he's asking, beyond digesting the new book as well as the panelists' other works, what advice do you have for a student for student psychotherapist already inclined towards holistic depth and existential perspectives? I know many people in their chapter covered um, graduate training and, and challenges in being exposed to these ways of thinking. Any thoughts on advice you might give to someone in the field who uh, is interested in joining us? I, I think that touches on a difficult topic for therapists of depth, insight, and relationship, which is not just an understanding of the past and of being able to describe the present, but being able to kind of look ahead to the future mm -hmm. because his practice or her practice or their practice, I didn't catch the name, is going to be in a fundamentally different world than the one in which we're practicing. Um, it's going to be a world that is profoundly remade by what happened in on March 12th and 13th with the release of those new um, artificial intelligence conversation systems. It's going to be a world completely remade by the challenges of global warming, which is going to change our understanding of political economy and how everything works. So my best advice to this person and, and their cohort um, is to remain nimble and strong and hold on to your values because um, without um, being a, a, a chicken little that the sky is falling, I think much of what we're talking about here and in the book will be colossally irrelevant within 10 years. Um, I think the world is gonna be that profoundly remade. Um, so I think the best thing someone can do as they're trying to kind of navigate into a career where they'll be providing a therapy of depth, insight and, and relationship is to stay nimble, to stay strong, and to hold on tightly to your values. Thank you, Todd. Enrico? Uh, just d d dovetailing what Todd just said, I think because of that, I think there's going to be a greater need for people to access therapy with an existential dimension to it, with a sense of urgency about, you know, uh, uh, living, living life, you know, anchored to deeper values, a deeper sense of 
uh, like like reinterpreting anxiety not, not, not as some clinical entity that needs to be eradicated but treating it as as a, a as a sort of an existential clarion call to get real to get more urgent to get serious about living life more fully so maybe the unintended one of the unintended side effects of that Todd will be more people accessing therapy or looking to therapists for 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 existential reasons and then quickly what one more thought uh, a lot of beginning therapists are saddled with a a, a, a sort of we'll call it a sort of a, a, a big brother relationship to su supervisors bureaucratic entity entities insurance companies as someone who's been in the field for decades when you get further out and this is a message of hope when you get further out you're, you're accountable to your clients at the end of the day. You're accountable to them, how they experience what you have to offer, whether or not they find it useful. And as you get better at it, they do. And that you can unsaddle yourself or unclutter yourself with all of those uh, uh, fears and worries about whether you're doing it right, doing therapy right or wrong, and according to some external criteria. A and there's great comfort that comes, great comfort that comes from just meeting with clients day in and day out and feeling accountable to them. And, and, and believe it, I think that, that that's a hopeful process. Thank you so much. I wish we had more time. I, I feel very regretful that we have such a short time to speak together. And I have so much more I want to ask. And I know other panelists do as well, but it is 830. So I want to respect our time boundary. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us tonight. Um, the remarks that everyone gave were so valuable. I really do recommend this book. And uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Um, as many of you know, 